Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. It has been a while since I've made any videos about the Electronic Lead Screw project. If you haven't seen it, the Electronic Lead Screw is a system that uses a motor and electronics to change the feed rates and thread pitches on a lathe instead of having to mess around with change gears. I made a whole series of videos about the entire development process, and I will put a link to that playlist in the video description in case you care. The whole project is open source, but I do sell kits with some of the electronics to make it easier to build. But as time has gone by, I've started having some issues sourcing some of the parts for the kits. So today, we're going to look at some changes that will hopefully make that better. This is the electronic lead screw running here on my Geo602 lathe. You can see we can change the feeds. This is all digital and controls a servo motor. We can switch it over to threading. We can switch it to metric and it supports all of this without having to mess around with change gears. But for today, we just need to get this off the lathe and look at the electronics. This front panel is just a PCB assembly. It's routed out and silk screened. It doesn't have any copper on it. Actually, it just has a sheet of copper for shielding and it makes a nice control panel. Easy to have manufactured. Let me pull this off, disconnect the wires and let's take this over to the bench and take a closer look. The stack up is held together with four M3 by 16 button head screws with nylon lock nuts. Easiest way to deal with these nylon lock nuts is with a socket driver, which is what I'm using here. We'll just get those four out and then take the stack up apart. The board on the back here is just a standard commodity LED and keyboard. These are made by a bunch of different manufacturers. I've forgotten I'd added those resistors. I was doing some experiments with noise immunity and that's why those are on there. Underneath the board, there is a spacer and the spacer is 3D printed. It just holds the board up off the display to make room for the buttons and the digit displays. It's got the 3D printed buttons. These are flexible material and are sandwiched between the front panel and the buttons on the PC assembly there and then a red lens to filter the light and make it easier to read the red digits on the display. And then of course the front panel, which is just another PCB that I had manufactured. I chose this particular display board just because they are so plentiful and readily available. This is really just a breakout for the TM1638 with some buttons, LEDs, and some seven segment digits. And these are all over the place. As I said, there are several different companies that make these. They're all over eBay and all of the usual places that sell Arduino gear often have these as well. And while the ready availability of these makes the electronic lead screw project more accessible and easier for people to do as a open source hobbyist project, there are some problems. For one, this connector is always soldered on coming out the front of the board which I don't understand because it makes it almost impossible to use in any kind of a control panel situation. So for the ELS, you have to desolder this and solder in a right angle connector on the back. And I've shown how to do this in previous videos. And it used to be easy, but they have been making this a lot harder. The holes in the PC boards in the last couple of batches I've gotten have been much smaller. So the connector, in addition to being soldered in there, is a press fit into the hole. So when you pull the pins, often you pull the copper and the pads off the board. And that is just bad news. It can be recovered if you're really good at soldering, but you know, most people who are trying to build the ELS are not, you know, electronics uh, wizards. They're just people who got to lay that want to put something together. So this has been a problem. The other issue that I've been having is quality. Of the last couple of batches of boards that I've purchased, I purchased them 300 at a time, and I have been seeing a lot of failures, which is why I built this little tester. So every single board that I resell, I run through a test first, make sure the buttons work, make sure the displays and the LEDs work, and I have been seeing failure rates as high as 5%. And since the manufacturer's in China, I can talk to the seller, but it's really inconvenient to deal with. And they always offer me some kind of a credit, but it doesn't do me any good when 5% of the boards that I buy and then provide to other people aren't up to a level of quality that, that I want to own. And so I've been actually just reworking them when they fail. The biggest failure that I see is just these LEDs across the top. And I just bought a bunch of three millimeter LEDs. This started out as a bag of 60 before I did my last batch of 300 boards. And you can see how many are left. There 
have been a lot of failed LEDs. I really don't understand why the quality has gone downhill. This seems pretty simple, but it has been an issue. Now the obvious solution here is to just have these boards manufactured myself to my own specs with the connectors on the back like I want them. I did talk to the manufacturer I buy them from and ask if I could get them without the connector or with the connector on the back. And they just told me flat out, no, this is a commodity product. They're just not interested in that. So I resisted spinning my own boards for a long time, but I think that's the point we're at now. And I think that's what I'm going to need to do if I want to have a quality product to sell. A quick Google for a TM1638 data sheet yielded this gem, which is lovely. It's in Chinese, but it does have the pinout and it does have application circuits. And these show how the grid and segment lines are multiplexed onto the seven segment displays. There's some information in here about how the keys are read, including the series diodes. If you want to be able to read multiple key presses at the same time, that's what the MELF diodes are on the LED and keyboard. So I think we are definitely on the right track. In fact, it looks like this LED and keyboard is literally just the application note circuits from the data sheet. So that's nice and easy. If you search for the LED and keyboard itself, you can come up with other data sheets like this one from Hands-On Technology, and this shows the schematic for the board that they import, and sure enough, it's exactly the schematic out of the application notes. So I just entered the schematic into Circuit Maker and picked out some components and laid out a board. This is really pretty straightforward. I have all the physical locations of where the LEDs and the buttons need to be because I have the 3D model for the control panel that I built around the original LED and keyboards that I was buying. So then it's literally just a matter of laying out all the copper so everything is electrically correct, generating Gerbers and sending them off to the fab. I cannot reiterate how much I don't want to do this. It's definitely going to drive up the cost, but I just cannot buy these in the quality and quantity that I need. The boards are back from the fab and they look pretty decent. I had these panelized two by two just to test the panelization process. Obviously, if I'm going to be manufacturing these by the hundreds, I'll want them in larger panels to try to keep the cost down as much as possible. Looks like they got the connectors in the right place on the back. Every time I order a board like this with a connector like this on the back facing in, I always get questions. They want to, they want to put them on facing out and they assume that I made a mistake in the parts placement. but. In any case, let's test it out. So far, so good. Let me get one of these lenses so that you can see it. Let's test the buttons. That's LED one, LED five. No, 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 no. These are in the wrong order. How did I screw that up? Well, they're definitely in the wrong order. One and eight are in the right place. There's seven, that's going to four. Two's going to five, okay. Something is definitely wrong here. Let's go back and look at the schematic. Well, sure enough, if you look at this schematic from the hands-on tech data sheet, they do indeed show that they're wired out of order. Segment one, three, five, seven, two, four, six, eight. Switch two goes to three, three goes to five. I have no idea why you would do this, but somebody did this. And then everybody who's made these boards since has just matched it. I don't know if this was for some application originally, but that's really frustrating. I can go ahead and just fix up my schematic. And honestly, if you look real close, you'll discover that the schematic I showed earlier already has it fixed because I shoot things out of order. But it's just a matter of fixing the schematic, then coming in and fixing the copper to match, spinning a new set of Gerbers and sending it off to the fab again. Two weeks and $200 later, and here we have some more boards. Let's see if these are any better. They better be. We have a lens here, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have no idea how happy that makes me. It's a simple thing, but getting the buttons and the LEDs in the right order apparently is harder than it looks. Try another one of these boards. Yeah, yep. This looks good. Okay, let's break this panel apart and put one of these together and try it on the lathe. This come apart pretty easily. I've never actually done any of this V-score panelization before, but 
that works pretty well. As long as we're taking another look at the control panel, let's look at these lenses. I designed the lens to have a cutout for the buttons. So the lens is just a sheet of clear red PVC, sits down over the back of the control panel, underneath the spacer, and then that holds the LED and keyboard off of the back far enough that there's room to sandwich these buttons between the key switches and the front panel. Now, of course, I don't make these lenses one at a time. I make them by the hundreds, and I do it using a fixture on the CNC machine. This is just an aluminum plate with an aluminum cap that clamps down a stack of these. And then I come back with a CNC program, run a drill through to put in the four holes in the corners, and then come back with a single flute cutter to actually cut out that notch. So this just comes around here, throwing little bits of plastic everywhere, making a horrendous mess. It's kind of a nice cutter. This is a single flute cutter. So you run this at really high speed and run it really fast and it just shreds the plastic. But really those screw holes down on the bottom don't need to be in the lens. The lens doesn't, lens doesn't need to be that big. It's just that big so that it provides a level surface for the spacer but it doesn't really need to be there there's no reason we can't cut that off and just have this be rectangular in fact it doesn't even need to be that big let me trim this a little bit more all it really needs to do is cover the holes in the top for the leds and for the digits and as long as it covers that we can cut out a whole cnc machining operation cutting out that notch the only downside of this is that you don't have a level surface, but that's only about 10 thou thick, and these spacers are flexible. Worst case scenario, I could add 10 thou to the top of that standoff, but I don't even think that is going to matter in this application. So we might as well just make the lenses smaller, cut out that operation, cut out the tool change. I can still use the fixture to drill the top two holes. In fact, I could even do that on a drill press. Should take a lot of labor out. And also while we're at it, I have a beef to pick with these spacers. The spacers have these wings on them that come out and cover the screw holes. And those just serve as one millimeter spacers to literally space this out one millimeter so that it comes a little closer to flush with the front of the box. And I only did that because I am a total perfectionist. But in retrospect, these have caused a lot more trouble than good. For one thing, they stick out a lot and they make it really hard to pack these things tightly on a printer bed. So I can't get as many on the bed as I would be able to otherwise. And they also serve as a point to peel up. And when I pack these in on the Cheaty iFast, these things often peel up and I lose a couple of these out of maybe every second or third job. So I have to measure every single one of these to make sure that these standoffs are still the correct height and that it didn't peel up and destroy the part. So those have been a pain. I think they need to go. Plus, they actually stick through the parts and get tangled. So when you get hundreds of these in a bin, it's really hard to manage them because they all stick together. But if you get rid of the wings, you can pack 18 of these in on the bed sheet of the X1 Carbon and print 18 in two hours and five minutes. And that makes a big difference if you're printing hundreds of them at a time. Now, I printed these ones in blue, but it doesn't really matter because by the time you put the red lens on it and the black PC board on the front, you can't tell anyway. We've got new boards, we've got new lenses, we've got new spacers. Let's stack them up and make sure everything works together. Put the screws in here. We'll just drop on the cut lens, drop on the spacer, put in our buttons and install the LED and keyboard on the back. Now the eagle-eyed among you will note that that doesn't look right. And in fact, the buttons are all already pressed. Everything is squished together too far and it's holding down the buttons, so this is definitely not going to work. If we take a look at the original LED and keyboard and measure the height of the buttons, including the PC board. I'm just assuming they're the same thickness. I didn't actually measure that, but we're sitting around six millimeters, 5.9, something like that to the top of the buttons. And on the new boards, it's six and a half. So the buttons are taller on the new boards. Now I did switch over. I didn't want to use through hole buttons. I wanted to use surface mount just because that'll help to keep the cost down because the through hole assembly costs more than surface mount. 
and it looks like I got burned because the buttons are actually thicker. Now, how are we going to compensate for that? We could make the buttons thinner or we could make the spacer taller. Now, if we make the spacer taller, that's going to affect where this board sits. It's going to affect where the LED displays fit. And I kind of like where those are. I don't want those recessed anymore. So I think our best bet is to make the button shorter. So let's go make some shorter buttons. I recently switched over to a Prusa Mark 3S Plus for printing the flexible buttons, and it has been working great. I can actually get 50 sets of buttons on one build sheet and print without any failures, which is better than the printer that I'd been using previously. The good news is that the thickness of the button was just a parameter in the CAD model, so I just updated it, and here's the old button, 3.53 millimeters, and here's the new button, 2.71. That should give us the extra space that we need. Let's just put it together now and see how it fits. This is take, what, three, four? I don't even remember. Well, it looks better. How's it feel? It feels great. Nice and clicky. They're just loose enough that if there are little, you know, differences in manufacturing, it should still work great, but they're tight enough that they're not really going to rattle around. And the LEDs are all still in the right order, so let's go put this thing on the lathe. The new board should be 100% compatible with the old board, so this should just be able to plug in. We should just need to screw it in place, and we should be good to go. Now the eagle-eyed among you again will notice that I'm using a two and a half millimeter hex wrench and these are five sixteenths inch screws, but they're close enough. Seems to be settled in there. There is a little lip around the edge. That's because the spacers are gone, but honestly it doesn't bother me like it used to. So I think we're good. Let's power it up. See what happens. That looks to be working. I generally like to run these things on my own equipment for a while before I give them to other people to use. So like, oop, did you see that? Did you see the flicker there? Yeah, that is something that I mentioned earlier about those extra resistors that I had added to the board I was using before. There it is again. That little momentary flicker is a single bit data communication error between the control panel and the microcontroller. And I have seen this before. Sometimes with some combinations of boards, it's no big deal. And with others, I see that more. And I think it has something to do with the cabling. Now there is protection in the software. So single bit errors are never going to cause the machine to do anything that you don't want it to do. It's just an annoyance. And honestly, I've noticed flickers like this on the control panel of the Prusa Mark III printers as well. There was another one and another one. Okay. This is bugging me. You saw on the board that I had on here earlier that I had put some resistors in parallel with the 10K pull-ups that were on the board to lower the uh, impedance there and bring it down to maybe 2K instead of 10K. I find that that helps with noise immunity. I guess I could do that here, but you know what? Since I'm actually making these boards, I could just change the values, the resistor on the board. So let's take this off the lathe and let me go see if I can find some resistors of the right value and let's solder them on and see if it helps. The resistors in question are these three 10K resistors here on the board. I'll just go ahead and add some additional solder so that I can melt both sides of them at once and then just go ahead and pull these off. This is not the easiest thing to do. I'm working under a binocular microscope here, and I am not an expert in surface mount soldering, but I can do well enough to get the job done. Let's clean these pads up with a little bit of solder wick and see what we've got to work with. As long as I get them off and I don't lift any of the pads, everything else can be repaired. And that looks like success to me. Use a flux pen here and put some flux down on the board. This is no clean flux, so we don't have to clean it up. I will just come back here and put a little solder on one side just to make it easier to position the resistors. I'm replacing the 10K resistors with 2.2K resistors, 
and I don't have any 0805, so these are 0603s, and I will just have to make them work. It's not going to be pretty, but I mean, come on, let's be honest, this wasn't going to be pretty anyway. Just go through tacking them down on one side and then coming back and soldering the other. Again, as long as we get it to work, this is going to be good enough. Put a little bit more flux over the top and then come back and remelt those joints just to clean them up. This is a nice little trick if your solder joints look like garbage, especially if you're using lead free solder like I am here. A little bit of flux and reheating the joint will do wonders for the appearance. Now, if I were going to give this board to somebody else, I'd come back and clean up that flux, but I'm not, so I won't. Back on the lathe one more time. Let's give this thing a shot and see if we fixed it. Now, this will be similar to the fix that I had on my lathe previously, where I'd put some of those resistors in parallel, except now they're in there natively. It looks good, but we need to run this for a little bit to know for sure. Run it through the speed range, just in case this is some sensitivity or interaction with the VFD. It's definitely looking more stable than it was. I'm liking what I'm seeing. Try it on threading here. It runs the servo at a different speed. Oh, and there was a glitch. I've just seen one so far, so this is definitely better than it was, but it's not, I would say, completely fixed. Now, I've been running this lathe for a long time. I've seen these glitches off and on. They don't cause any problems, again, because the software filters it out and a single bit error is never gonna cause the machine to do anything unexpected. But I don't like it. It doesn't inspire confidence and it's not perfect. It's not the way I want it to be. When I was not controlling the boards, there wasn't a lot I could do. Now that I am in control of this board, there is something I can do and I, and I want to try to attack this. I have some ideas for how to make this better. Unfortunately, it's going to require re-spinning the boards again, which means another round trip, at least one more to the fab. And I will get started working on that. I haven't seen any more glitches just watching this. So I think this is, I will say, mostly fixed, but it's not perfect. And I think it's possible to make it perfect. So I'm going to take another run at this. That's probably going to end up being another video, mostly because of the turnaround time waiting for the fab to manufacture the new boards. And I'll get back to you. I will try to get this done as soon as I can, because I'm going to be out of stock of these momentarily, but I don't want to restock if I've got something better coming. So I'll get to work on this and you will hear from me shortly. This project has taught me a lot over the years. It's not just about designing something that will work, which the ELS does, or even about packaging the parts up as a product. If you want to make something like this and make it available in any appreciable quantity, it's all about the processes. I'm just one person and I have a full-time job in addition to running the YouTube channel, so small differences in per unit labor can make the difference between something like this being possible and it being completely out of reach. That said, it's likely the boards will be out of stock for a couple of weeks while I wait for the fab, but rest assured, I am working on getting more. If you enjoyed this little peek behind the curtain, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and maybe consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. If you're already a patron, you are an integral part of what I do here. Thank you, and thank you for watching.